It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. So we're going to talk about the presence of God. There's so much to cover concerning praise and worship and uh, it's so misunderstood and, and um, it's a very controversial subject in the church. And so what I'm going to do is take us back and give us a little history into 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I'm going to read that whole chapter so you can follow with me because it's very important for you to know about the ark because that's where the presence of God was at that particular time. It was in the ark. And so we're going to go on over into praise then because uh, the word of God, which we'll get into in a little bit, says that he inhabits our praise and his... <laughs> well, go ahead. Look at that. Isn't that sweet? Give him a hand. I probably won't sit on it, but who knows? I may. Anyway, so let's go over into 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 1. And um, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, David was fixing to go and get it because it contained the presence of Almighty God. <clears throat> and so we know when we get into the New Testament in a little bit, you're going to, and even into Psalms, that praise is what brings the presence of God to us now. And so that's why praise is so important to us. So let's just start right there. And again, David <clears throat> gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal, I can't, I can't pronounce some of these names, of Judah, to, to bring up from thence the ark of God. Now here we have 30,000 people going to bring up this ark. Can you imagine what a procession that was? That was people made up, all kinds of people. And here they were. What were they going after? The presence of God. It wasn't just an ark. It's where the presence of God was. And so um, he said that, let me get back to of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark. Now, this is real important. They set the ark of God up on a new cart. Did you get that? Everybody say new. New. That's important. They set the ark. They set the presence of God. Another thing I want you to realize when we see the word ark, think presence of God. Don't think of some wooden something or another. Think of the presence of God. So they set the ark of God up on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah, Uzzah and Ahau, Ahau, the sons of Abinadab drove the cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. Now then you need to know some of these definitions. The word played, when you look that up, it means danced to music, voice and instrumental. So here we have David and th how many thousand? 30,000 people playing before the ark, dancing with voice and musical instruments as they were taking this cart from where it was. That had to be mighty to see and experience that. Okay, so they played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to the uh, Nikon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, the presence of God, and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. Most commentaries, when you look it up, say that the oxen stumbled. And no one was supposed to touch this ark. They were not supposed to touch the where the presence of God was housed. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perezah Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how in the world am I going to get this ark to me? How am I going to get it out of there if I'm not supposed to touch it? Well, 
Let me ask you a question. What should David have done? Because David looked at this and he thought, you know, it's my fault that Uzzah died. Now, why do you think he thought it was his fault? Did anybody have a, an answer to that? I see Mark looking at me. Do you know Mark? Well, it was because they had distinct uh, instructions on the way to handle the ark. The ark was not to be put on a cart. Remember I told you to pay attention to the word cart? They had specific instructions on how to move and how to carry the ark. And David did not follow those instructions. So he felt real responsible for us as death. And actually it was. But at the same time, Uzzah did know what the rules were, but David allowed it. So the ark had to be moved. And I wrote down some notes here. The ark was to be moved by the Levites and was to be carried on the shoulders, not a cart. Even the Levites were forbidden to touch it. Okay, so let's go on here. And so uh, David was so displeased and, you know, kind of fear and all of this came over him. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come into me? How am I supposed to get it? That's what he was saying. How am I supposed to get it? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord, now remember, what is the ark representative of? The presence of God. So the presence of the Lord continued because it's where he was housed in the ark, in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. He was, Obed-Edom and all his household was blessed because they were, they had the presence of God there. Okay. And it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him. Now that's real important. Everything that pertained to Obed-Edom, and you can take this over into where we are today, everything that pertained to Obed-Edom was blessed because of the presence of God. And so what does praise do? It brings the presence of God. You know, you can't be silent in praise. Praise has to have a voice. And a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm just praising in my heart. Oh, that just irritates me. I'm telling you when I hear people say that, well, I'm just praising in my heart. No, you're not praising him. Praise has a voice. And it's just like the uh, confessions of your mouth. You know, the word has to be spoken. And so don't, if you don't participate in praise and worship, you are missing out on the presence of Almighty God in a mighty way. Now you may see other people, you'll probably see me up here. I mean, I shout and I dance if I want to, or I raise my hands or whatever, because that's what the word says to do. But if you don't open your mouth and praise God <clears throat> with verbal praising, you are not doing scriptural praise. And you may sit back there and say, oh, me. Sorry to be so hard, but that's just the way it is. So David went and brought up the ark of God. You know, he realized, hey, we're missing out on the blessings of God. We're missing out on the presence of God. I left the presence of God in obed Edom. What in the world's wrong with me? Well... What are you doing about the presence of God? Are you worshiping him? Are you praising him? Because that's where he inhabits is the praises. Okay. I'll give you scriptures for that in just a little bit. So David went up and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Now, when I looked up that word gladness, it meant especially with joyful music and song. Does that not amaze you? Everything has to do with music, joyful music and song. And it was so that when they bear the ark of God <clears throat> of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced. Well, my stars, we're not supposed to dance in the church. You're dancing before God and you're going to see what he says about that in a little bit. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. He was exuberant. Very exuberant. You know, pride keeps you from doing that. Pride does. And David was girded with a linen ephod. Now that's important. And David was girded with a linen ephod. He was not naked when he was dancing before the ark. 
And I've heard a lot of people say, well, he didn't have anything on. Yes, he did. You're going to see that in just a minute. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, that 30,000 people. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. They were so excited about bringing the presence of God back to where, they, where it belonged. They showed exuberance. They shouted and praised and they danced before the presence of Almighty God. They were excited about praise and worship. Okay? And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Listen to this. See if this describes you or anybody else you know. And Michael, Saul's daughter or his wife, looked through a window. Can't you just see that? Man, man, here comes the ark with 30,000 people praising and singing and dancing before the Lord and shouting. 30,000 people and David was leading the way and he was dancing, dancing and here she is peeking out the window. Wonder what she was thinking like some church people. Thank you. Amen. So his daughter looked through, Saul's daughter looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Oh, it made her so mad and so angry. King David, what does he mean? Out there showing off himself like that in front of all of these people. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, forgive me, Lord, for leaving your presence back in Obed-Edom. He blessed the people and in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people. He took care of all the people's needs among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. Now, where's your thoughts going? You know, I looked that up and marking some of the commentaries because I know you do commentaries and all that stuff too. But it talked about the wine. Uh, it was the berries and it was made into cake. It was hard pressed into a cake. And that was, I don't remember what commentary I got that out of, but I thought that was good. So all the people departed, every one to his house. So here are all these 30,000 people, they left. David took care of them. I guess they were party, par, probably exhausted from all that praise and worship and, you know. Then David returned to bless his household. Oh, here's his wife. Here's Saul, uh, Saul's daughter. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She was watching for him. She was ready to jump right in the big middle of him for acting like an idiot. Okay. So she came out to meet David. And boy, was she ready with her mouth. And that's the way a lot of people are about praise and worship. I just had to get that in. And she said, well, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. Well, he wasn't totally uncovered. He had something underneath that, okay? And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord, which chose me before your father did and before all his house so to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord of Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. Now remember what the definition was for play? He danced to music with his voice and instrumental. That's what he was explaining to her. Therefore will I play before the Lord and I will yet be more vile than this. He said, you have not seen anything yet. You think I was very vile for dancing and shouting and praising and worshiping the Lord and leaping and twirling and worshiping God like that. He said, you ain't seen nothing yet. Well, neither have we with the move of God that's going on. Because some of you sitting here today are going to find you one of these days doing the very same thing after you swallow your pride. Okay. So I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. He said, they're going to honor me. All those maid servants that you said would 
that would be disrespectful to me, they're going to honor me. And they did. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. So that gives you a little background then of the importance of the presence of God, even back in the Old Testament. They had to go and get the presence of a God because that's where it was housed. But today the presence of God is in you. And the, and the praise and worship stirs that up. And, and he said he would inhabit it. So Hosea 4, 6 says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And that's why we're teaching on praise and worship. Because when you get the knowledge of what praise and worship will do for you, you'll become a praiser. And see, a praiser praises. And that's the problem with a lot of people. They're not a praiser. And I would say unto you, do you go around your house, ask yourself, do you go around your house praising God? Because a praiser will praise God, not just in church. And of course, we know there's different types of praise, and we're going to be talking about music and that type of thing and songs basically tonight, but there's you know, other types of praise. <clears throat> so there's a saying that we tend to be down on what we are not up on. That is so true. And so what we're doing tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, is bringing you up on praise, the biblical praise. So I'm gonna read you an article, excuse me. <clears throat> and this is the article. The church has suffered a theft of one of its most valuable treasures namely praise. I thought that was really interesting. At some time in its not too distant past, the church was victimized. <clears throat> the fact is, in the wake of its loss, there has come an atmosphere so foreign to praise that there is both a fear of biblical praise and a resistance to it. Do we not see that? But you know what? God's moving. His Holy Spirit's moving, praise God. But what we have seen down through the years is a resistance to biblical praise. People don't want to raise their hands. Do you remember the first time you ever raised your hands? You know, and, and you eventually got it up. Do you remember uh, the first time you uh, shouted or whatever? Well, people are gonna get past this resistance to praise. <clears throat> He said, went on to say that the church has been the victim of praise, of piracy on the seas of time. The devil has stolen praise. Why? Somebody tell me, why do you think a Satan has come against praise, biblical praise, so much? Why do you think he's done that? Do what? I can't hear you. Kills, steals the adventure. Okay. Yes. Draws all men to him. Well, <clears throat> and also, thank you, dear. Uh, Satan knows about praise. He knows what praise will do. He knows that it will steal him. It will stop him in his tracks. He knows it will do that. And you know what? He came from a place of praise because he was the anointed cherub. That's where he came from. He was called Lucifer before he was called Satan. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28 real quick in verse 13. Uh, 28, 13. <clears throat> this is talking about Lucifer here, Satan. He says, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. And when you look that up in different uh, commentaries, the tablets is talking about drums or tambourines. And then the pipes, as you know, would be like flutes and that type instruments. So he... They were prepared in him in the day that he was created. And so most commentaries and most ministers think that he, he was head of the worship, that he headed it up. That was his job. So he knew what worship would do, okay? So um, to drum, we have drums, praise God. So Satan lost his position of being in charge of praise. And God put praise in you. He put praise in me. You and I are in charge of praise now. You are. You're in charge of praise now. And you have the power of praise within you. Praise is a power within you. 
If you ever get a hold of that, it'll mean a lot to you. So praise is for what God has done and worship is for who he is. And some will say, well, it's the fast music and then the slow music. Well, normally we call praise, well, you can tell by the songs what's praise. And that's for what God has done. We praise him for what he's done. We sing songs that praise him for what he has done. And then when we worship him, it's more like an intimate time with the Father. It's for who he is. Now then, I want to read you another little story. A woman went to China as a missionary, and she contacted smallpox. In those days, that was a death sentence. Smallpox was very dreaded. So she was quarantined in her room. So she began to pray and to talk to God for help. He told her to begin to praise him for his faithfulness. That was her instructions from God. For his faithfulness to his word. You know, isn't that a lesson for us today? To start praising him for his faithfulness to his word. And instead of, of, you know, Father, I thank you that I'm healed. Praise him for his faithfulness to his word that by his stripes you have been healed. Faithfulness. And then he showed her a vision of two baskets. One contained the trial, which was smallpox. So here was this basket. And it was full. And then uh, that means it. she was totally consumed with the problem. She was totally consumed with the sickness. And so that basket was full. And the other basket contained her praises. And that basket was only half full. Are you getting the image? The Lord told her the praise basket needed to be filled with praises so it would outweigh the basket of the smallpox, the trial of the smallpox. And when the praise basket was full, her healing would be manifest. So praise is so important then in our healing. Believe for it. Spend time praising God, praising God, praising God. And that's what he told this woman to do. So she began to praise every day and every night. And people thought she had lost her mind. She continued to praise him. And finally, after several days of praise, her basket was full. What happened to her when her basket was full of praise? What happened? It affected her mind. It affected her her thoughts. It affected her emotions. Praise will affect your soul. And praise will get your, your spirit back in control. It will elevate your spirit above your soul and those thoughts. And her thoughts was on that smallpox and all of that. But when she began to pray, she could not see the smallpox for seeing the Lord. That's so important to us. Do we praise that much? Do we spend that much time in praise that it elevates our spirit so above what the problem is that we can't even see the problem? All we can see is the answer. That's how important praise is. And that's how important it was to her. So her mind couldn't see the sickness any longer. She walked out of the quarantine, out of the quarantine room, completely healed and without a scar. What happened? Her praise brought the presence of God on the scene. And that's what praise does. Praise God. So when we praise, it takes our thoughts and places them on God. It'll place them on the word of God and on the answer. Praise God. Then remember that praise affects the soul of man. Now I want us to go to uh, Matthew chapter 21. I can't see that clock back there. Somebody will have to... All right, me. Uh, Matthew 21, verse, we're going to look at verse 12 when I get there. Susan, are they this quiet when you're teaching? I try to get them to answer questions. This is Bible study. Okay. Okay, Matthew 21. Let's look at uh, verse 12 here. And Jesus went into the temple of God. Remember this story? And he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the whoremongers, or money changers. Oh, I got that other. And the seats of them that sold doves. 
<laughs> you gotta love me. Y'all just gotta love me. <laughs> I'm sure they were there too. <laughs> okay. Oh, baby. Y'all need to come to Bible, ladies' Bible study sometime. That's the way it goes over there. Anyway, and he said unto them, to the money changers and those that were selling goods, and he said unto them, it is written. He was saying something that God had said. He said, it is written. If it is written, it has to be that way. It is written that by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. It is written that we are to lift our hands and we're to praise, praise the Lord. It is written, okay? So it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, he came into the temple to purify it. When he saw all this going on, he purified the temple. He drove all them out. But the thing of it is, when I begin doing some study on this, that the chief priests and the scribes were so displeased, and it'll tell you that in just a minute, because it was a work that they should have done themselves. They should never have allowed this in the temple. This was in the outer court that they were doing this, where they had all of this set up. Okay. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. I tell you, he cleaned house. He got rid of all of that junk out of the temple, got it back to being a house of prayer and a house of praise, and people that needed healing started coming to him. And they were healed. The lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priest and the scribes who should have been the ones to clean out all of that junk that was going on in the house, in the temple, they came and they saw the wonderful things that he did. And the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna, you gotta get a picture of this. The children were all praising God. They were hollering, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, to the son of David. They were, and anyway, the chief priests and the scribes were very sore displeased, it says, and said unto him, to Jesus, hearest thou what these say? And Jesus answered them, yes, I hear them. Yes, I hear them. Yea, have you never read? Remember, it's established, it's written. Have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou shalt perf thou hast perfected praise? Now then, I looked that up. No, that, that's not the scripture I want to go to, I don't think. But um, Satan will tell you that he doesn't want you to praise. Amen. Now, I want us to uh, go over to Psalms 8 and 2 because here he says... Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Now, in Psalms 8 and 2, look at that. He uses a different term there, but it means praise. Psalms 8. And verse 2 says, now this is uh, repeating what Jesus just said. He said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained praise. And that word ordained means founded. He founded praise. He says, that hast thou ordained or founded strength because of thine enemies, and that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. So we know that that word strength there could be translated praise. So let's read it that way, because that's the way it was written, okay? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained or founded praise. Why? Because of their enemies. He says that you might steal the enemy and the avenger. So there we see what praise will do. It will stop Satan and his attacks right in the tracks. It will go no further. So if you're under attack tonight in a physical way, or if your finances are under attack tonight, you start praising God and you, you will stop the process. It will steal the avenger. It will stop him. It can go no further. It stopped. If there's a sickness in your body, it can't go any further. It stopped if you will begin to praise him. But you've got to praise him. And so many people don't want to do that. They don't want to do, spend time in praise. 
And listen, as I said before, you can't think it. There's no power in thinking things. It's in when we release the words. And certain, certain Satan will tell you that there's no power in praise. He'll tell you that. Don't praise. Don't lift your hands. Just praise him in your heart. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Let's look at Isaiah 61 and verse 3. Isaiah 61. I'm getting there. Okay. He says, let me just go ahead and start with verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Remember Jesus saying that? Because the Lord hath, appoint, hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to com comfort all that mourn. Now here's where we're going. I'm gonna just pick one of these out of this particular scripture. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Praise will stop the heaviness. Karen, come up here a minute. He says that we're to put on the garment of praise. This is praise. This is the garment of praise that we're to put on. Put your arm in here, sister. You're being rebellious. <laughs> you told me to be. <laughs> <laughs> She will not let me put on her the garment of praise. I cannot put it on any of you here tonight. Only the word of God can put it on you. Now then, so Karen has heard tonight the word of God that you're to put on the garment of praise. I didn't have to put it on her. She wanted to put it on. You can probably keep that on. <laughs> Thank you. But that's what he's saying he said, you have to put on the garment of praise. Nobody can make you. But that's why we teach. Because the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you the desire. He has to give you that desire to put on the garment of praise. Praise has to be put on, and it's your choice whether you do it or not. And at this particular time, this uh, garment of praise was to replace what they wore to express their grief. Now, many of us here probably all of us, have gone through periods of grief in our life. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do what he says right there. Put that garment on. And, and your mind, Marilyn, you put it on. You start praising God for his goodness. Whatever, the spirit comes out of your spirit. You begin to praise him and praise him. and praise. It will excel you above that grief. You can't just think about what happened all the time. Grief will overcome you. You've got to put that garment of praise on and you have to make yourself do it sometimes because it has nothing to do with how you feel. Whether you want to put it on or whether you don't, you have to put it on. You have to be obedient to this and it will, all of a sudden you'll think, praise God. Your praise may start out in the beginning as forceful. <clears throat> you force it, but the next thing you know, it takes over and praise will still the avenger because you see Satan wants to keep you in grief he wants to keep you in worry he wants to keep you thinking well I'll never get out of debt put on the garment of praise start saying what the word of God says he says I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out he says he'll bless everything I set my hands to do so I'm going to start setting my hands to do a lot of things and you begin quoting what the word of God and you start praising him for what he has promised you and you will rise above the worry about your finances. And all of a sudden, your mind will be so clear and free from all of that pressure that you can think of things to do. I'll never forget, I think Thomas mentioned this before, <clears throat> when we were in Florida one year, how it was in Miami, I think, babe, wasn't it in Miami? That, you know, five and six lanes of traffic. And here was this man with his little window washing thing in the middle of the island that divided the lanes, washing people's windows. 
And people would tip him pretty good. He probably made more than some of you sitting here during the day. But God will give you ideas in the midst of your praise. Start praising God for your finances. Start praising him. Father God, I, I need ideas and I'm going to thank you for them right now. You see, when we ask, we're supposed to receive. Amen. So whatever situation it is, you just need to get acquainted with praise, folks. You need to get to know about praise because God gave it to us for a reason. He gave it to us to stop and to still the avenger. It's for us. It's not for him. It's for you and for me. And like I said, it doesn't matter how you feel. You start doing it, and those feelings will come in line with what you're doing. You'll find yourself dancing, going around in circle, leaping and twirling. Praise God. So you have to put on a praise garment as an act of your will. What is your will? It's your directional ability. So that's what you do. I can put a garment on you, but it won't work that way. You know, there's no way I can put it on you. There's no way. Wesley, you can't put it on them. Our praise team, we can't put it on them. We've got to let them see what it will do. Praise God. So let's look at Psalms 22, verse 3. Okay. Um, In verse 3, it says, But thou art holy, thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. So he's telling us here that God will inhabit your praises. That means he's going to get involved in your praise. It looses him. It activates him. He's used to being in praise. You know, heaven's full of praise and worship. And if you're not used to it, you better get used to it if you're going. Because you're going to have lots of this stuff going on. So... um, He inhabits our praises. So when we come into our church and we begin praising God, expect God to inhabit your praises, your praises. You want him to inhabit your praise, not my praise, not Wesley's praise, not our praise team. He wants to inhabit your praises. That's why I get so happy up here. It's because he's inhabiting my praises and all I can do is praise him. I think things will come to my mind and I think, oh, Lord, God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, you know, you're just overcome with that praise. But if you're so against it and you're so rigid and you cannot get you cannot be a spectator in church during praise and worship. Now, I know you all still love me, but this is biblical. It's very biblical and you'll be set free about a lot of things. Start at your house. You know, my dog, when, when I'm there with just my dog and Tom's come to the office, I mean, he thinks I'm, she thinks I'm crazy sometimes. Because I'll just go around the house singing and praising and I'll make my little circle and I'll open the deck door and go out on the deck circle that praising God. Start at home. Praise Almighty God. You know, I look out the window of my house. Even if I'm sitting in my recliner, I look out and there is this two acre pond. And I see the horses running across the pasture in the front yard. And along, every once in a while, there come some deer and jump the fence. And and I thought, God, praise you, Father. This is so beautiful. And then I'll say, Father, where did we get all of this? Where did we get these boats? We're so blessed. I think, "How how did we get all of this, Father? He said, didn't I tell you the blessings of God come upon you and overtake you? Yeah, they do. They, the blessings of God overtake you. Praise God. You can always praise God for something. Okay. So he inhabits your praise. That's important that we get a hold of that. He's going to inhabit my praise. He's going to get involved in my life if I praise him. It brings him on the scene. Now let's look at Zephaniah uh, chapter 3. Oh, I love this scripture. I dearly love this scripture. I'll give you a minute to find it. It's back close to the New Testament. It's before Zechariah and Haggai and all of that. So I'm going to give you a chance to get there. It's on page 1116 in my Bible. Are you there yet? Because I want you to see this. Zephaniah 317. 
The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He's mighty in the midst of thee. What brings him on the scene? Praise and worship. Do you notice that the gifts of the Spirit will operate when we have great praise services? Because it causes us to be sensitive to the voice of God. So he says, he's going to be mighty in the midst of thee. I'm telling you, God's mighty in my midst. I don't know how he is in yours, but I know he's mighty in my midst because I'm a praiser. Amen. So the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love and he will joy over thee with singing. God would never ask us to do something that he doesn't do himself. Amen. The word of God says, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Well, there's all kinds of musical instruments. There's all kinds of praise going on in heaven. He says, you let it be on earth like it is in heaven. What are we doing as, uh, was it Tim Brooks? It said, we're bringing heaven down here. When we praise God, we are bringing the way heaven is to the earth. I'm telling you, God gets excited when we praise God around here. I love our praise and worship, and I'm going to be like David. It's going to get more vile than it has been. Amen. So, what's so interesting, when you look up the word uh, rejoice in the Hebrew, and I don't remember exactly what the number was on this. I have this written down in my Bible from studies years ago. It means to leap and twirl. Oh, oh we better go back and look at this again, see what God does. He says, he will leap and twirl over you with joy. God believes in dancing over you. He's excited about you. But we need to get excited about him. There's healing in his presence. There's deliverance in his presence. There's liberty in his presence. You hear the voice of God in his presence. There's instructions in his presence. You'll be able to hear him. Whatever it is that you have need of, get in his presence. Bring his presence into you by praising him. So he says he's going to leap and twirl over you. And then he's going to sing over you. I wonder what he's doing right now. When we come into our praise and worship service Sunday morning, uh, image God. What you doing, God? Well, I'm just dancing and praising over you and leaping and twirling, just like David did when he brought my present back to them. Just like David did. That's what I'm doing. I'm singing over you as you sing over me. Listen, this is real stuff, Susan. It's real stuff. But you know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Amen? So, rejoice and leap and twirl. I love that. So he will rejoice over you with great gladness. He will love you and not accuse you. That came out of the Living Bible, I think. And then this is the Living Bible. I'm going to read you what it said. Uh, when it said, he will um, let the Lord thy God in the midst of thee, he says, cheer up. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God has arrived to live among you. He will give you victory. He will rejoice over you with great gladness. Remember, that was with singing and dancing. He will love you and not accuse you. And then he says, is that a joyous choir I hear? Remember what Jesus said over there? He said, is that a joyous choir I hear? No. It is the Lord himself exalting over you in a happy song. That's pretty neat, isn't it? He wants to sing and praise over us, but he wants us to respond to him. And praise is a response to him. So let's look at Psalms 150. This last book of the Psalms, this is one of my favorite Psalms also. But if you want to know about praise and worship, read the book of Psalms. Because it, it'll tell you now, I'm, I'm not getting into all the different ways of praising and worshiping tonight. But I wanted to give you the background. And so study um, the book of Psalms and you'll see what is proper for praise and worship. Okay, in verse 150, chapter 150. Praise ye the Lord, praise God where? In his sanctuary. That's, that's here. Praise God in his sanctuary. 
Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. He'll give you some things to praise him for if you'll just read the word. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. The trumpet is one of my favorite instruments. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals, loud cymbals. But it hurts my ears. Oh God, heal them. Heal them, Lord. Music gets loud around here. I like it. But you know what I found out? If I'm praising, it's not near as loud. It's not near as loud if you are participating and not a spectator. You can't hear anybody else but yourself. Would y'all please say, I love you, Bonnie? Thank you. I needed that. Okay. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Now, that's not to say every service is going to be wild and crazy. You know, I'm not saying that. But some of them are going to be. They will be. And so when it is, just know that whoever's on those cymbals is really praising God. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything <clears throat> that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. That it includes every person in here that we're to praise the Lord. Okay? Praise and worship is the atmosphere of heaven. And he said, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to bring that atmosphere into our church services. And we're going to be a participator and not a spectator. Now, and this is a quote. It says, the greatest cure known to man can be found in praising God. Are you sick in body? Are you tormented in the mind? I remember reading a, oh, it was a praise book years and years ago. I don't even remember which one it was on praise that this author said, if they would play nothing but praise music in the insane asylums, that you would see the mentally sick healed. I believe that with all my heart because praise has a work to do in each and every person. And the next thing you know, it'll heal their mind. Praise God. So the greatest cure known to man can be found in praising God. It says that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So we need to prepare ourselves before entering into our services. Get rid of anything that would be a hindrance to God's presence. Because praise brings God's presence on the scene. And God, I love this statement, God cannot do what he has designed us to do. He has designed us to praise God. And worship and he has given us the privilege of creating the atmosphere for his glory and for his power to be present it's our responsibility to create the atmosphere and uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to teach again after tonight but uh, David Insull will be next week and he's going to teach on the temp on the um, tabernacle which this will go right into that of the tabernacle but if I ever am asked again, <laughs> I'm going to teach on the glory of God. The glory of God coming into our services. And praise is going to be a part of that, bringing the glory of God. Because the glory of God is his presence. So, before Sunday, spend some time in praise. Start praising him. Father, I thank you that you will be manifest in our services Sunday. We've got a great speaker coming. Father, I thank you that the eyes and the ears of the understanding will be enlightened to his glorious gospel. That's what I pray for you concerning the teaching on praise and worship. That the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. Because you don't, if you don't praise, it's because your eyes and your ears have not been enlightened. But if you'll receive the message tonight, you will be enlightened. I can hardly wait for Sunday morning. I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait to see some of these hands go up in the air. I think, God, they heard you. They heard you. Well, Father, we thank you for tonight. We love this word, Father God. 
We thank you that as we study your word, that we're putting you into us. Because this word is all about you. It's all about Jesus. So, Father, we thank you that it's instruction for us. And I pray over these, these people that are here tonight. Holy Spirit, I ask you to minister to everybody. I take authority over pride. I take authority over people that, that they so, are so conscious of who's sitting next to them. What will they think about me? Well, they're going to think they're praising God. So, Father, I thank you for the atmosphere that we will have here this next Sunday. I thank you that you will be manifest as we sing praises, and we will all be a participator and not a spectator. And I declare that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a super great night. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.